Hi everyone. Uh, so I came all the way from Belgium to show you an interesting site we've dug up, well I've dug up. Uh, it is here in Belgium. You see the small map on the left hand side. Uh, it's not as mountainous as Wales, but still this point is a shift in height in Belgium. So it means that from that point onwards, well here you see uh, exaggerated, of course, the, the path of the, the rivers. The, the small river there called the Petit Jet goes to the Skeld, which in turn goes to the North Sea. And it's the last point where it's actually the last point of navigability of that river, which makes it interesting. Um, so we have some geomorphology first. Oh, sorry, this is back down to earth for a start. Uh, so we have a thick layer of colluvial deposits which have covered the site. And you see the river on, on the cross section there as well. Uh, they tell us things about uh, the climate in the past and also how the, the site was set up. So here it is. This is a cross section, the real thing up above, a schematic view down below, which shows you about where we found what type of feature at what level underground. So the, the most interesting thing here is that we have at least three layers of colluvial deposits over the features. And that the, well not three over the features, but that all the features do cut the first colluvial deposit. Colluvial deposit comes from what? From erosion. Erosion comes in our countries from land clearance. So it means that here, for proto history, we are not on a pioneer site. It means that this area has seen some, we don't know how much, land clearance, <coughs> which means it's not covered in woods anymore. So, uh, I'm always hesitating of showing the next one first. Uh, I was going to say, we're, we're not going to dwell here on the first Iron Age site, which you will see on the next slide, uh, which is post holes, granary pits, reading pits, palisades, etc., from, dating from 800 BC, we're in first Iron Age. But we're going to look one level below. So here is the excavation about 1.4 hectares in total with over 600 archaeological features some pertaining to the Iron Age, the most part some late Bronze Age or early Iron Age which would fit together and then we had 15 peculiar features peculiar in that for instance there are post holes Okay, but you're going to see there are many post holes on that map. But they are not your usual post hole. An Iron Age post hole, in this case, would be one which is shallow, about 30 centimeters deep, 30 to 40 wide. <coughs> the backfill around the post is always kind of dirty. You'll find burnt earth, charcoal, bits, potsherds, and whatnot, flintstone. These, in turn, are nearly spotless. When you find charcoal, it's very small amounts. And also, they're not the same because they are deep. When I say deep, I mean really deep. They're from 1 meter 30 to 1 meter 40 under the layer that we scrape. When we uncover them, they all go down to the bedrock which the others obviously don't. And why is that? Because here is one. So you can tell uh, the scale is 40 centimeters. Uh, down on the right hand side of the image, you see the bedrock. It's gluconeous sandstone. 
Then we have the loamy deposits on top. Those are glacial deposits, which already have been moved by uh, mudslides. So they're already not in place anymore. Colluvial as well, if you will. And in the middle, you have uh, the post hole. The cross section drawn on site is on the left hand side. Uh, oops. <coughs> Wait, also, one last thing I need, sorry, to say here is that the difference also is without, well, I, uh, okay, depending on how you find them, they might be part of a building, right? But they couldn't because they're, except for three of them, they are spaced too far apart. They're between 9 and 12 meters apart which is a huge distance. And so that was ruled out. Uh, I thought, well, I don't have the pointer, but you see like the three stones in the middle. You could draw a hexagon with the, the central part there, but there's one missing. There was a felt tree there. So we even went as far as cross cutting the fell tree to see if there was not a post hole under it. Why would I look under a natural pit? Well, because those are peculiar post holes. Since they're that deep, even under a fell tree, I would see the trace of such a post hole because it goes down to the bedrock and cuts into it. So, unfortunately, there was none. And there went our building hypothesis <coughs> out of the way, so to say. So here is a schematic I made, just to show you, so you have bottom left, uh, the post in its post hole. Post hole is quite narrow, as you can see. Then a secondary pit is dug around it. Then its sway moved back and forth and upwards and removed. And then eventually backfilled. This is really important. And we can tell how it was backfilled as well from the type of fill we have in the middle. Up above, on the left hand side, you see what we can deduce from the section itself, how it was moved, in what direction, where it actually compressed one side, then the other, then the other. So this was also uh, viewed by a pedologist from the French INRA. So I'm invited as you would say. And to the right, up above, you have what we found. Well, that is the actual uh, excavation picture, which shows the middle part is the part with the backfield. How can we tell that it was backfield? Because of the size of the particles that you have inside. They hardly ever exceed five millimeters. Which means one thing, well, if you dig a hole and you want to backfill it and you have a pile of dirt on the side, you'll get big chunks going back in. Here, it's been, they've been scraping all around to backfill it. And when you scrape, you get small, small nodules. So there we go. Well, this is, of course, this is not round. Well, it's Belgium after all. We have all the sections of all the post holes. Uh, you'll notice one missing, but I'll explain that in a bit. Those are the 15 vetted accepted <coughs> post holes in Linsmo. You can also tell that quite a few of them have what we call uh, a horse's leg. Uh, the bottom part, like uh, this one, for instance, is shorter, not because it's different, it's less preserved because of erosion. So you only have the bottom part of the same post hole. That post hole also went to the bedrock, also cut into it. Uh, my geologist, by the way, said that to dig such a deep hole this narrow, they must have had, but that's another story, a specific tool for it. Because they're hardly ever wider than 50 centimeters, Try just 
if you have nothing to do, try to do that in your backyard. <laughs> Not using an iron spade, please. And then, well, we're going back slowly to the sky. So we, well, when I say we, of course, it's mostly I. So that, yeah, we had sort of an orientation at first, but that's also a bias that comes from excavating in that it depends which hole was the first you found, which was the second one, then the third, then you built your hypothesis. And then, well, it goes on. If I had found the bottom right one first, maybe I wouldn't have thought of all that at first. So we had two lines that looked like a right angle, maybe roughly north to south for the meridian and east to west for the other one. And then we noticed uh, other alignments, well, just drawn lines between big posts, and the one going to that southeast looked interesting. Looked interesting, I used an app. Uh, Jay Gieson wrote that years ago. You find it on the internet in Java. Showed, well, might have been, have something to do with a winter solstice or not. So, be a nice flat. 3D model, put the posts in and looked at the winter sunrise and it looked like the shadow from one went to the other and so on and so on. But that's flat. That's going from a flat feature. So that's wrong. With this hypothesis, well, we went to see Georg in Vienna. Uh, on the bottom right is part of the work we did, which he showed like in more detail this morning. So that's the data extracted from the Belgian LiDAR. On the right, the data I went there with. And on the left, the data reworked by a Belgian guy, but working for the LBR Art Pro, which enhanced for the same way the data then we made the 3D. Then, as he showed this morning, we have the actual aerial view, and then we cut into it. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, the central part, as he said, is actually what I surveyed during the excavation. So I talked about colluvial deposits, erosion, and so on. So well, if you have erosion, it means that your hills are getting lower, but in the valleys, well, the floor is rising. So here, what we have is a survey of the whole excavation under the colluvial deposits. So it's the closest level you're gonna, ever going to get to what the actual slope was back then. Of course, taking into account erosion and so on. So we put that in the middle, and that one is accurate uh, within five centimeters in altitude. So it's not bad. Then we put the post and put it in a very famous program, <laughs> Stellarium, not to tell it. And then we looked at the possible winter solstice, and it was a bridge too far. That didn't cut it, a few degrees off, was not there. We even thought, well, you know, they could have also aimed some stuff at the stars. But then again, when you have posts, and even if they're aligned, you can always find a star rising in front of it. So going like that, uh, yeah, didn't work. So we just left that out for now. Then another idea popped out. Well, you see, you were talking about bias earlier. There's also an archaeologist's bias in which one line is made of three points. But we always, archaeologists, look for the three points on the Earth. Three posts make one line. Two posts are always aligned because there, you need a third. In this case, the third one is not on the ground. You're looking for something up above, and here we're going back to the heavens. So if you take two posts, 
and you look for an alignment, then suddenly, well, we looked for all of them. I'm not saying there were alignments that were between all the posts, of course, but we found a few significant ones. So first one is was summer solstice, sunrise to the right red line, and sunset to post aligned to the sunset. I'm nearly there. Then we also found one for the major lunar standstill. I think this one, this alignment is, speaks for itself. Uh, rising and setting as well. But if you notice, we have two green lines to the right. Okay, they're parallel. They're aiming towards the same event, but not at the same time. Okay, the one to the left is dated roughly at 2 Sigma, we're in 1350 BC. The one to the right is 1800 BC, also calibrated 2 Sigma. <coughs> so we here have two lines which could be, one could be rebuilt after the other one. Next, we found something which is, yeah, something that people don't like because if we're, we're in the early Bronze Age here and this cross quarter, if it is there, is only accepted for the Celt, so that's to say Latin and Hallstatt period, so back to 800 BC. But we're a thousand years beyond that. Anyway, if you look, we have maybe also two lines, but we have all four of them showing. So we would have, you know what the cross quarter days are, right? All of you? No, I gotta know. <laughs> so I get to do my joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so well, you know one, it's, uh, it's got an American name now, the first day of the year for the Celt, Halloween Samhain, 1st of November, then you, got, you get the winter solstice, okay, after the winter solstice, well, we're not French, but we like crepes, and so in February, early February, it's crepe days, and, oh, Strangely, it's a second cross quarter day. And then, well, you have Equinox, it's not there, anyways. Then after that, uh, I think it's called Labor Day in England. We call it. It's the American. Labor Day on May 1st. Yeah, May 1st. Then you have Summer Solstice. And then something which has been, has a bit, has fallen a bit out of use. It's the Harvest Festival, early August. So you see, we still have those time markers now. We just don't know where they come from most of the time. So I'm not saying they were there, but it's possible. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening.